for tonight. Uh, I'm really thrilled to be able to talk about the wings over the Somme and effectively the role of the Royal Flying Corps uh, during the Battle of the Somme in 1916. And um, this isn't a subject that I um, in any way pretend to, to be an authority on, but it's certainly something I have a huge interest in, uh, specifically because I find that when I'm uh, away from the battlefields on family holidays that involve beaches and things, um, I tend to take a Royal Flying Corps memoir with me to read. And uh, so when David said, come on, let's have something new from you, I realised that I've probably got about 50 of these. So I thought they'd be good to dip into and see if we could have a specific look of the role of the Flying Corps on the Battle of the Somme. So it's nothing too groundbreaking, but I, hopefully you'll find it uh, very uh, informative as we go through. And I should start straight off with the fact that um, in recent years, perhaps in the last 10 to 15 years, we've had a lot of good academic study on the role of the, uh, the, the Royal Flying Corps in particular on the Western Front. And um, that's leading us to have a lot more sensible view on exactly what that role entailed and the sort of things they got up to. Um, because had it not been for the works of people like Peter Hart, who did a lot of good work on his Somme success book, as well as a number of academic papers that have been written on the subject, um, if it was left up to just the Hollywood and, uh, you know, the popular press of the time, we would be obsessed with that romanticism of the air race, which is the largest myth that exists really as a result of the Great War and the Royal Flying Corps. Certainly in the 1920s and 30s, there became almost an obsession with talking about fighter pilots. And I've just put a few on the screen there for you to look at, starting, I guess, bottom left, as many of us started reading when we were youngsters, the Biggles books, Biggles of 266, uh, fairly heavily focused on fighter pilots as such. Um, but uh, the real breakthrough in Hollywood was the, the making and the remaking of the film um, Dawn Patrol, the initial one starring Douglas Fairbanks Jr., as you can see, which was a big Hollywood hit at the time. And then later on, you see top to the right there, to the, you see that's Basil Rathbone, who also starred in, uh, in, in the film. Now, of course, Basil Rathbone would have had his own experiences of the Western Front as a, he served with the London Scottish Regiment uh, and was actually uh, wounded on the 31st of October um, up just outside Mezines in 1914. And that was followed by various other uh, films that came out, the Epic of the Air, which is the film called Wings, that was done in the 1930s. And you could follow that right through really to uh, even to Snoopy's obsession with the Red Baron. Uh, and uh, I suppose uh, even if you remember back to the 1970s, that um, series that we all watched called Wings, uh, which I was obsessed with as a child, but being an anorak that I am, um, I noticed in one of the episodes, the trench map that was on the wall behind them was actually a trench map of Verdun, which really upset me because I was preaching to my parents that the Royal Flying Corps wouldn't have served at Verdun, and they told me to get out more. They're probably right. Um, really, the true uh, role of the Royal Flying Corps is summed up in this mantra that you find on silk postcards and handkerchiefs and various knickknacks that made their way home in the early parts of the war. And uh, it's a four line little ditty, but it sums up the role of the Flying Corps perfectly really for me. They call us the eyes of the army, for we scout for the foe far and wide. And with all of the information worth having, we keep the powers supplied. What that's really telling us is that the genuine role of this flying corps is one of intelligence. That's why aircraft are involved in the war in the first place, reconnaissance and intelligence. And that's the major role they have right through to 1918, but tends not to be quite as fascinating as that of the fighter ace. So let's look at the Royal Flying Corps as it starts in France in 1914 and the sort of progression that it makes. Well, four squadrons initially fly across. They total 63 aircraft. And uh, when they arrive in France there, they have a strength of 105 officers and 755 other ranks. They've got around about 90 motorized vehicles to assist them as well. Now, this would have been quite an incredible achievement that the four squadrons in mainly get across there are a few accidents and incidents on the way um, because safely crossing the channel would have been quite an achievement this is just and we need to remind ourselves of this um, constantly just five years after Blériot's groundbreaking flight over the same ground and here were these guys packing off to war now they do play quite a vital 
role in reconnaissance during that retreat from Mons, uh, notably on the 22nd of August, uh, when they uh, pretty much sight in of von Kluck's uh, army coming towards and prevents the encirclement of the BEF. And then just uh, nearly 10 days later on the 31st of August, when another reconnaissance patrol managed to see von Kluck's army has swung southeast. And those at the very top of the BF at this stage start to realise the relevance of uh, air power with regards to giving you an advantage over what the enemies are up to. Uh, one of the problems that we will face uh, through 1914, and you could argue pretty much right through to 1916 really, is that uh, the consistent prevailing wind that we find in France was a 20 mile an hour southwesterly. And when you've got aircraft that are only capable of 60 mile an hour, this means that it's a quite a long journey home up against the wind. So it's quite easy to get out over the enemy lines, but coming back will be quite a problem. Also that plays into this we need to realize is the sun, which obviously rises and sets uh, the same way every day. And this meant that generally uh, morning flights were the most hazardous for the Royal Flying Corps as the sun was directly in your eyes. You tend to find most German activity will be in the morning. And then once it gets to midday and beyond is when the Royal Flying Corps really take part. Um, on the Battle of the Marne there, number five squadron, they actually report directly to Douglas Haig, uh, which is the first time that we actually get them up to a uh, core level. Uh, so you have a squadron reporting directly to a core, uh, whereas number three squadron are directly reporting to Smith Dorian. This is also the first time that we actually see the use of wireless as well uh, in the front lines. More of that a bit later, but we're starting to see the developments are coming thick and fast. Throughout 1914, the Flying Corps is led by this chap, Sir David Henderson. Uh, he had started off as an officer in the Argyll and Sutherland Highlanders. Uh, he'd actually been wounded and wounded a DSO at the Battle of Ladysmith in South Africa. Uh, when he came back from that wound, he was uh, appointed to the intelligence branch. He decided to take his uh, flying certificate in 1911, and when he passed that, aged 49, he was actually the world's oldest pilot which is quite an achievement at the time. Um, so successful was he with the Royal Flying Corps uh, that in November 1914, he was actually offered command of the 1st Division. Uh, and, um, you know, this would have been quite an achievement for him, no doubt, but Kitchener intervenes and decides, no, we need him in the flying services. And eventually that command went to his chief of staff, uh, whereas um, Henderson went back to the war office and was, uh, along with General Smuts, was um, largely responsible for writing a paper on air power that we know today as being the Smuts Report. In fact, Hugh Trenchard regarded Henderson as the true father of the RAF, which is a title often bestowed upon Trenchard himself. Um, Henderson did have a son, and sadly that son died in a flying accident in June of 1918. And after the war, he went on to become the Director General of the Red Cross in Geneva, so quite a character. By the time we get to 1915, we really do see an evolving Air Force, and we'll go through a few of the highlights uh, of what occurred in that year. The real breakthrough for the Royal Flying Corps was uh, this notification that appeared early in 1915, when the establishment for the new army of 30 divisions was produced. Colonel Branker, who was really batting for the Royal Flying Corps back in the War Office, worked out it would need at least 50 RFC squadrons to support the expansion. Um, when they circulated this paper around the War Office, it provoked critical and incredulous comment, as if to say, you're not getting that amount, mate. But within an hour, however, the Secretary of State had minuted the request and simply written, double this, K, Kitchener. In this one moment, all obstruction and financial restrictions were swept aside. And throughout 1915, it was reconnaissance that remained the major task in and role of the Royal Flying Corps. Perhaps the most significant one of these being Captain Strange of Sixth Squadron, who on in April 1915, when flying over Epes, uh, witnessed that strange green glass, gas cloud that was uh, starting to head in towards the Breton and colonial French troops and managed to raise the alarm to give us an indication that a gas attack was imminent. Just a few weeks earlier or months earlier at the Battle of Neuve-Chapelle in the March, 16 Squadron had actually been the first squadron to plan 
for infantry contract contact patrols. And they were going to do this by the enemy putting out, or sorry, the infantry putting out some visible strips on the ground so they could mark their progress. Now, sadly, the Battle of Neuve Chapelle did not go as well as was uh, hoped, and therefore those infantry never get in the position to try this out. But it was certainly in the planning stage. Um, and also at Neuve Chapelle, we see the first sort of specific bombing raids on particular targets. In this case, Courtrai Station and the Menin Junction. And the idea being that they were stopping the German resupplies from reinforcing the front line. Aerial photography becomes a significant player uh, at this stage of the war and far more of that later. And also wireless. I mentioned them earlier, but this was a big breakthrough. The adoption of the Sterling wireless set. Prior to this, wirelesses had taken up the entire cockpit of an aircraft. We now managed to reduce the weight of that wireless set from 75 to 20 pounds, which is quite a saving and made it a little bit more mobile and a little bit more flexible for its use. On July the 25th, Leno Hawker, again, more of which we'll hear later, um, was awarded the Victoria Cross. And it's him you can see in the picture here, flying his Bristol Scout over the skies of Ypres, where he took on three German aircraft, one of which he did manage to shoot down. The pilot Hans Rosa is buried in Sanctuary Wood Cemetery. He was awarded the Victoria Cross, and uh, that was the first Victoria Cross to be awarded for aerial combat. So quite a significant breakthrough and a shift in the way we look at our flying services. But perhaps the most significant change of all uh, was in August when Hugh Trenchard actually takes command of the Royal Flying Corps in France. And it's to him that we turn now. Now, to be fair, we could probably have an hour's talk just on Lord Trenchard and, and his life. It's a fascinating life, really. Um, but we'll concentrate with him just pretty much up to uh, the Battle of the Somme. Um, he's commissioned into the Royal Scots Fusiliers. Uh, he serves in India, uh, but is continually frustrated for not getting enough action in the front line. That eventually changes in the Boer War, where he's shot at uh, pretty much close quarters uh, coming out of a farm building. It's a, a life-threatening injury that eventually um, involves him losing the capacity of a lung. And he's evacuated back to Switzerland to recuperate. It's actually while he's in Switzerland recuperating that he decides that uh, despite this injury, he's going to take up the bobsleigh. And uh, he actually has a, a quite a serious accident on the Cresta Run. Uh, but this the famous Cresta Run, I always think of it as Blue Peter as a kid. Um, uh, but he um, got himself injured again. But on this case, the injury actually does something to his spine that actually aids his uh, rehabilitation. And uh, he actually wins a couple of uh, bobsleigh trophies, as you can see there. He's a very successful tennis player as well. And all of these sporting achievements convince the war office that he is actually fit for service. So he returns to South Africa. And then after the Boer War, he goes on to serve for his, in his regiment in Nigeria. By the time the First World War comes about, he's transferred across to the Royal Flying Corps, of course, and he's in charge of one of the brigades during the 1914 offensive. When he takes over the Royal Flying Corps uh, in general in France in 1915, he really has three mantras that he stays, to, stays true to, and these are in the, their order of importance as he sees it. The first one is, sorry, the first one is, the primary role is of the Royal Flying Corps is to provide reconnaissance to support those ground forces. And by ground forces, we mean both infantry and artillery. So it's very on message with that one. The secondary role of the Royal Flying Corps is to maintain morale. By being up and flying up over the lines, not only are you using your air power to raise morale amongst your own troops, but if you're active and aggressive enough, you will demoralize the morale of the enemy. And thirdly, and perhaps most controversially, uh, was his total belief, an unwavering belief, it said, of the offensive action. That is, the Royal Flying Corps will dominate the skies and the air battle will be fought over German trenches, not over our own. And where he does come under some criticism at times is this is obviously a very costly venture and leads to quite a heavy toll on lives within the Flying Corps itself. Now, by the time we get to the Somme in 1916, remember I said there, was it 700-odd uh, 
um, personnel and however many aircraft they had 63 aircraft in France by now in 1916 by the November by the end of the battle the Royal Flying Corps had grown to 46,000 personnel there are over 2,700 serviceable aircraft in France and from that they were separated into 64 operational squadrons and 33 squadrons that were serving in the reserve quite a considerable expansion there I don't need to go through them all for you, but really that's showing you how the order of battle looked. It was split up into five separate brigades. Uh, the top one there, nine brigade was attached, or ninth wing was attached directly to army headquarters on mission specific tasking from them. But then as you can see, the first, second, third, and fourth brigades were all again attached to uh, units at the front line. And generally they consisted of two wings, between five and six squadrons each, and also, very importantly, a kite balloon squadron as well, and more of that a bit later. The most common types of aircraft that we see um, used by the Royal Flying Corps on the Somme, and I've just pointed out four here in particular, um, uh, show how quickly things are changing on the Western Front, because actually there are 14 different types of serviceable operational aircraft that we're flying between July and November. But we'll go top left to start with. And uh, what you're looking at there is the de Havilland II, the DH-2. Um, initially, it was uh, fairly unpopular with pilots and uh, led itself to being given the nickname the spinning incinerator. Um, but it won its uh, spurs back, really, by being the one of the principal aircrafts that saw off the Fokker scourge of the previous autumn. So the Royal Flying Corps were able to start to take control of the skies, whereas in late 1915, they had a real problem. The DH-2 was, uh, because of the, the fact it was a pusher aircraft, had a very good observation there for the gunner at the front who was armed with a Lewis gun. Uh, it had a 100 horsepower engine at a top speed of 93 mile an hour, a ceiling of 14 and a half thousand feet, and you can see it could stay in the air for around about two hours 45. Then to the right of that, you see the Newport 11. There are a number of Newport variations, but the 11 was quite popular at the time of the Somme. Uh, again, this had a Lewis gun fitted to it uh, that had that uh, sort of uh, interrupter system that meant you didn't fire at the propeller, but through it. Uh, 110 horsepower engine, so a lot faster, 110 mile an hour, certainly one of the quicker machines of, of its day. And also that height there of 17 and a half thousand feet nearly, that's two hours that could be in the air. Then you have the Farman um, Experimental from the uh, uh, 2B, and there was also various other 2Cs uh, and D variants. That had two Lewis guns, interestingly, one that fired from the front and also one that was above the wing that fired from the rear. Now, this was quite hazardous for the gunner to actually operate because you'd have to actually lean out of the, uh, the, the front of the aircraft there, point himself over the back of the wing and fire up while the pilot managed to maneuver it, the aircraft so you could get a clean shot of that person that was pursuing you. And uh, a number of observers were lost over the side. There was no seat belts or anything at this time and changing the drums on them would also be a problem. 91 mile an hour though, um, 11,000 feet ceiling, and had a range of 248 miles. And I like this photograph here, because it actually shows a padre conducting his church service from the front of the uh, FE2, as if it was a pulpit, which is quite, uh, quite nice, isn't it? And then the bottom left one you can see, which is the Moraine Paracel. And again, Moran or Moraine had a number of different variants in operation at the time. And uh, this was the type that was being flown by Cecil Lewis. Uh, when we come to in a moment, his um, uh, patrol that he did on the first day of the Battle of the Somme, he was in one of these aircraft. This had, was very heavily armed in a Vickers gun and a Lewis gun on board, 110 horsepower. It was used generally for recce and artillery cooperation uh, roles there, uh, at a speed of 97 mile an hour, two and a half hours in the airtime, and around about 12,000 feet it could operate at. So they're the kind of ones that were quite popular there. And in fact, the DH-2 top left was exactly the sort of one that Leno Hawker's 24 squadron, the first Royal Flying Corps squadron to really be geared out as out and out fighter pilots would have been operating on the Somme. And in fact, the sort of aircraft that he met his death in during the battle. 
That's not all of the aircraft that we have, though. I said there was nearly two and a half, 2,700 of. The workhorse uh, of the Royal Flying Corps, a bit like the hurricane in the Battle of Britain, the real workhorse here is what you see. This is the BE-2, and it came in a couple of uh, variants. There were over 3,000 of these were produced, and in fact, 13 of the 28 squadrons employed on the first day of the Somme flew some form of BE-2. Now, these had not really been that popular with pilots, and they'd certainly been um, prone to attack during the Fokker scourge of the previous autumn. Uh, and you can see why, really. We've looked at the sort of variance and the speeds of the aircraft on the previous page. This was only capable of 70 miles an hour. It's a fairly slow and cumbersome. It did have both a Vickers gun and a Lewis gun, and of course was a two-seater aircraft, so you know, it did have a gunner working with you as well. Um, but were very inferior in air-to-air -air combat, so largely employed on reconnaissance and bomber duties as well at strategic targets behind the German lines. But often they would have to be escorted by offensive patrols of some of the quicker aircraft. But they were the main aircraft that were employed. What sort of missions did we undertake then in 1916? Well, I've decided to put them into four different brackets. There may be more, but these are the four main ones that we'll be talking about. First one being contact patrols, that is directly assisting the artillery and the infantry as you're flying over the, uh, the lines. Next one being reconnaissance patrols, uh, deep over German territory, trying to spot any changes, new trenches, aerial photography. You can see there the chaps actually, as well as assisting the aided, aiding the uh, wounded pilot from his almost wrecked machine. You can see he's also got a camera there in his arm. So photographic recognition stuff was big. There would be kite balloon work. I think two out of every three Royal Flying Corps um, missions or sorties that are flown throughout the battle are actually done by balloons. And then finally, the work of offensive patrols, which are out there to try and uh, dominate the skies and prevent the enemy from using any of the ground or any of the airspace. And we'll go into these in a bit more detail, each one. So the first one we'll look at are these contract patrols of 1916. And Geoffrey Norris in the history of the Royal Flying Corps says, perhaps the most important use of new aircraft during the Somme Offensive was that as direct support for the infantry. The duty was known as contract patrols, contact patrols. And more than any other type of sortie, this brought the pilots and the observers right into the flick of the fighting on the ground. One of the developments that came into being for the Battle of the Somme that was most useful was the 303 incendiary Buckingham bullet that you can see on the right there. This left a, a when you fired it, it was a trace around that left a, a sort of a column of smoke down to the targets, so very good for identifying targets from the sky and useful for ground troops. It was one of these that was being flown by Cecil Lewis uh, on the battlefield himself. And you can see there his description as he was flying across the Somme lines when all of a sudden there was an ear splitting roar, drowning out all of the guns, flinging the machine sideways in the repercussion air. The earth column rose higher and higher to almost 4,000 feet. There it hung, or seemed to hang for a moment in the air, like the silhouette of some great cypress tree, then fell away in a widening cone of dust and debris. And what Cecil's actually describing there as he flies over La Vaucelle is the launching of the Loch Nagar mine crater. And of course, there were three launched at very close uh, proximity around the same time. Um, and this hadn't really filtered back to the Royal Flying Corps that this was going to be happening. So you imagine flying over a mine crater in any sort of aircraft is something, but to do it in one of those sort of uh, um, moraine parasols that you saw would have been, I think, most hazardous venture. Cecil Lewis comes into his own after the Somme, of course. By 1917, he's joined the very well-regarded 56 Squadron, which was full of aces, and he's actually credited with eight victories once he's flying an SE-5A. Doesn't see service on the Somme, that aircraft, very reliable. Um, but that would make him an ace in his own right. After the war, he goes to, he gets a job for Vickers, uh, where he goes out to China and uh, he teaches Chinese pilots there to fly the Vickers commercials for the, uh, it's from the Peking to um, Shanghai route. Um, he's there for about a year and a half, and whilst he's there, he meets and marries the daughter of a Russian general. They come back to London. In 1922, he's actually a founding member of the British Broadcasting Company. 
he's not only a writer for them, writing some of the scripts, but he's one of the earliest sports commentators, commentating on events from 1925 onwards. And in 1937, he actually becomes an on-screen presenter for the fledgling BBC TV, filmed just up the road from where I am now in Alexandra Palace. I often think of him as I'm passing on the train. Incredibly as well, there can't be many fighter pilots that do this. In 1938, he was also awarded an Oscar for his screen adaptation of um, Pygmalion. George Bernard Shaw uh, wrote some lovely words about him as a character. I felt he was quite an amazing chap. Um, so an Oscar as well. Um, by 1940, he's still hanging around Air Force circles, managed to enlist and uh, becomes a squadron leader in the RAF. So it's most of his time in the Med training, Egypt, Italy, that sort of area. And then 1955 to 1965 becomes a reporter for the Daily uh, Mail, not a paper I read, um, more of a socialist worker guy myself. Uh, and then in 1970, uh, which just when you think, you know, this guy's in his 80s by now, he decides to sail to Corfu in a yacht he buys with his third wife, Fanny, and he stays there right up until he dies in 1997. What an incredible life that is. I think he's 99 when he dies and spends the last 27 years of it in Corfu. Quite an incredible chap. The last of the fire traces, I believe, that was still around, whether he ever spoke at a WFA branch or uh, contributed to stand to, I don't know. But here's another quote of his as we go back to his time on the Somme, and I've put that over the top of a, that moonscape that would have been familiar certainly by the September, October, not by July, August, the battlefield didn't look like that, but later on in the battle. And he says, the next day we were up at 3 a.m., and we took to the air at four, dawn over the trenches, everything misty and still above with a prospect of heat to come. Even the war seemed to pause, taking a deep, cool morning breath before plunging into action. We were out to find the exact position of La Boisselle, for even now, on the fourth day of the offensive, the Corps intelligence did not seem clear on the point. We sailed over the mines and we called for flares out with our klaxon. After a minute, one solitary flare spurted up, crimson from the lip of the crater. It looked forlorn, that solitary little beacon. In the immense, immense pitted miles of earth around, we came down to 500 feet and sailed over it, trying to distinguish the crouching khaki figures huddled in their improvised trenches in the khaki colored earth. It was not easy. And you can imagine how hard that would have been to spot your own troops flying over that Western Front landscape and how yet to come down to such a height you'd be putting yourself at risk from ground fire. Another good account of contact patrols, uh, although I have to say this one is as near to faction as we get in the First World War, was written by Ross A. Stuart Wortley. And Ross A. Stuart Wortley was actually doing his flying training in 1916 and went on to fly throughout 1917 and 18, where he learned an awful lot about contact patrols and an awful lot about flying and fighting in the air. So he wrote a, a, a novel, you could say, uh, based around the mythical pilot known as Michael John Enderby and his experiences on the Somme. So even though it's not directly his experience, this would have been stuff he would have got from people he met in his squadron he spoke to. And it really is a really good description of what it would have been like fighting on the Somme. And you can see there that the contract patrol, he talks about those contact patrols over Teepval and Free Corps. And day after day, I fly over that system of trenches until by now, I know them like a book. Mazed though they are, I believe I could find my way about the, the blindfold. And he again mentions this use of klaxon horn. They found it the most obvious way of announcing your arrival to the troops down below. We announced our presence with a klaxon horn. One by one, the white letters, the code of signals were displayed upon the ground. BB, HH, the enemy are retiring, length and range, came up the silent cry of units of the 34th Division. We flew back with these messages. The long day wore on. Twice and three times the pilots returned to the aerodrome, replenished their petrol tanks and were off again to the line. It had been a day of high hopes, partly realised, partly disappeared. The situation is still obscure. Tomorrow we shall know what we have gained and what victory has cost. I fear it has cost the RFC a few lives that can ill be spared. 
But this uh, sacrifice, and these efforts by these pilots didn't go unnoticed. And when he writes this passage, it does actually come from a direct um, occurrence uh, that happened during for his squadron during the Battle of Passchendaele. So this isn't um, made up at all. It's just typical of exactly what had occurred post-battle. The COs expressed their appreciation of the work of the RSC as regards to contact patrols. There are several concrete instances of signals being picked up by machines and being acted upon with satisfactory rapidity, especially those asking for modification of artillery fire in both intensity and in ranging. Several suggestions for bringing about the closer cooperation between the two arms were made, notes of which I took and I forwarded to the authorities. And I really appreciate that kind of tactical and operational looking at what you've just done and how we can improve it because all too often the Great War is just put in a big book marked what a waste of time and we all tonight on this call know that wasn't the case. These guys were doing the best they could with the equipment they had and continually thinking and seeking to improve themselves. A good example of contact patrols working successfully occurred on the 14th of July 1916 in and around the area of High Wood. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with this photograph that shows a Secunderabad brigade of cavalry uh, that were about to charge into the corner of the high wood. This is taken, I believe, in Chimpanzee Valley as they're forming up for the attack. Um, well, of course, the division, the infantry division had gone off into the attack, were now fighting it in the wood itself. And uh, the um, contact patrol was being flown by Captain Miller and Lieutenant Short of Free Squadron. They flew over the back of the wood and noticed there was a large amount of German soldiers hanging back there in a sunken lane that was almost in certainly going to be a bit of an ambush or a trap as our troops advanced. Realising they weren't able to get through on the wireless or any sort of um, way of communicating with the troops on the ground, they decided to drop and fly low, coming down to around about two to 300 feet, strafed up and down the German line, which inevitably drew fire and alerted the advancing Brits and Indian horsemen to the fact that there was a large body of Germans there waiting in sunken ground. Um, not content with that, and even though they were taking rounds through the aircraft and the airframe, they decided to fly over once again, sketch the positions of the enemy, and then fly over the top of the Indian cavalry and drop a message bag to pass exactly what was going on. I think this is a fantastic example of air-to-ground cooperation, and we're seeing it not at the Battle of Amiens, not at the Battle of Le Hamel, but actually on the Somme in 1916. We now move on to reconnaissance patrols, of course, um, and that's a, a lovely sketch that was done by uh, Talbot Kelly. Wonderful chap, wrote a fascinating uh, book on the First World War, uh, Subalton's Odyssey, I think it is, is it? Um, anyway, I'll come to me uh, by the end of the talk, no doubt. Uh, and he um, illustrated it himself, and I think they're wonderful watercolours, Dear old David Cohen used to have his sketchbook. It was wonderful to look through them all. Anyway, Vivian Voss, uh, who flied with 48 Squadron, he talks about these reconnaissance flights and how unnerving they were to take part. When a flight was formed into special reconnaissance flight, the dud days lost their appeal. They generally be looked upon as legitimate holidays, but now they became periods of anxious activity. It was seldom that any pilot did more than one reconnaissance a day any of us would willingly have chosen two offensive patrols in preference to one bow show. It's that idea of flying over the enemy lines on their positions. Someone who was a regular fly in these was this chap here, John Hugh Sampson Tyson, 22 Squadron Royal Flying Corps. He had a pretty much a box seat for many of the significant events that occurred on the Somme fighting. He was flying an FE-2B, uh, they were operating a reconnaissance unit tasked with locating enemy fuel dumps, railheads and camps deep behind the lines. And just a number of notes from his diary, 1st of July 1916, patrol and watch the intense infantry attack. He's almost lost for words at the scale of what he was witnessing. By the August, 25th of August, while on patrol at eight and a half thousand feet over Combles, we saw two hostile aircraft flying over Goudicourt towards flares at 4,500 feet. We dived on them and got on the tail of one, firing a drum at about 80 yards. We then had the main petrol tank hit. We turned towards the hostile aircraft and fired again, just at about 50 yards range. Tracers were seen to enter the machine. One engine stopped and we turned west, crossing the lines at 3,000 feet before we landed. 
On the 15th of September, of course, he witnessed the use of tanks for the first time, where he said, I patrolled for one hour before daylight to see the opening of the show. It was a wonderful sight and far better than July 1st. Tanks were first use. However, things started to change by late September and the Germans got a bit more aggressive. Whilst on offensive patrol at 4.30 p.m., five hostile aircraft, type E's, were encountered over bus. Lieutenant Roberts and Lieutenant Williams attacked one hostile aircraft and it went down in a steep spiral and crashed at D2 Central. This machine was seen to have one set of planes or wings. It crashed and was just at the edge of the road. It looked as if it had crashed into a telegraph poles or wires. The crosses on the undamaged planes were clearly visible. The time was now 4.30 p.m. And I should think that note's taken directly out of one of his combat patrols. He would remain in the uh, Air Force, the Air Services, right through to 1940s, where he actually commanded 16 Group in the Second World War. Now, we talked briefly about aerial photography, but let's see how it does uh, advance. The first time it was used successfully, really, was on the AIM, as early as the AIM, September 1914, when Lieutenant G.F. Prettyman uh, took some snapshots literally hanging over the side of his aircraft. Obviously, we needed to improve that system. By the time we get to September 1915, we've actually um, created a school of photography. This was um, uh, based at Farnborough, uh, where we employed people not only as photographers, but also as interpreters, so they could in, uh, interpret the uh, air photographs that were taken. I should say that a number of people that were employed in this role were archaeologists who were very used to looking at shadows on the ground and using their archaeological nouns to uh, interpret uh, photographs of the time. It was found that aerial photography, the minimum height you needed to be to get a void, um, get an oblique view, the best view would be from two and a half thousand feet, 6,000 being the highest you could go before it got blurry, and the ideal optimum height you would be looking for would be 4,000 feet. So by the time we get to the SOM, uh, we decide that photography is such a significant part of it that we start to have photography units in each squadron. These usually consisted of one NCO and three men, as you can see here, using a very later model of, uh, of sort of camera or training for a camera that is on the scopes there. Um, you had uh, photography officers that liaised directly with brigade headquarters and army headquarters intelligence sections, thus cutting out the middlemen. All of the core wings undertook photographic work for counter battery jobs, whereas the army wings is specific photographic work required by the army staff. Now, how long would this take, you probably ask? Well, we've got a good example here. On the 10th of June, 1916, number two squadron of first wing um, took the photograph at 7.50 a.m. At 10 past eight, the machine landed. At 8.32, the finished print was dispatched to first corps headquarters, and 8.39, it was received by first corps headquarters. 49 minutes from taking the photograph to being in the hands of the planners to show you why photography was so important. And what did this mean, mean to the infantry on the ground? Well, I wanted to get this point across. So what I've done here is, unfortunately, it's not blown up too well, but I've taken a, an aerial photograph and then also we've got a trench map of the same area. This is Gomacor, the area around Nameless Farm. It's from later on in the battle. You can see it's dated 23rd of November 16, so not the uh, attack of the 1st of July by the 56th London Division across this ground. However, the units face in this position were still using the same trench maps that have been issued prior to July. So why does aerial photography assist us? Well, we're looking at that and you're matching it all up now, don't saying, oh yeah, that's the right place, that's the right place. It's only aerial photography that announces to the infantry that actually the Germans have built two new trenches there. I've put where the yellow lines are. Now this is quite significant because as an infantryman, this is exactly what you don't want to come across as a trench you didn't know existed, more cover, more chance to be attacked from the flanks, or in fact, bombing parties to come down and attack you. So that's why aerial photography makes a significant difference to the infantrymen on the ground. We now move on to offensive patrols. Uh, these were twofold, really. The first thing is definitely to deny any battle space at all to the enemy. It was key for us to dominate the airspace over the Somme so that our ground troops get, get on and do the job that we were asking of them. The second 
uh, role of offensive patrols was actually to escort the more vulnerable reconnaissance bombing patrol aircraft that tended to be a lot slower and cumbersome. One of the chaps that took part in this was George Lewis, who wrote a book actually called Wings Over the Somme, very good read. He was with 32 Squadron, and he describes how the air battle changes throughout the summer. In August 1916, he says, during the last week, our fellows have been scrapping every day. The Hun is usually pretty frightened of a DH, a DH2 that is, and there's one there in the background you can see, and make a habit of putting their noses down when attacked. Each time we fire at a Hun, we have to write out a combat report. And at the end of the last few days, there's been a large pile laying on the CO's table. Now the situation changes by the October 1916, where he records the Huns are getting braver. I've gone in for the usual dashing about and fruitless expenditure of ammunition. If I can't find anything better to fire at, I empty a drum into villages or dumps or Hun trenches. It bucks the infantry up. Now, one of the reasons why the Germans were getting a lot braver at this stage of the war is that largely their fleet of aircraft was also modernizing itself quite significantly. Far less of the Fokkers that had been the successful aircraft of the previous autumn were now being outmaneuvered by some of the later British uh, aircraft. We now find a lot more albatrosses that again given them a slight advantage and of course we get in towards that period as we know the following spring April over Arras as bloody April and that's what happens throughout the First World War one side, one mark of aircraft, one development in their ammunition or their, their uh, weaponry means that you get the advantage. Another chap that writes about it is this fella here, William Fry. Uh, he uh, wrote a, a, a wonderful account of the um, uh, First World War called uh, Ace of Battle. And uh, he describes um, being involved in an offensive patrol where he says, and this is very evocative for us. This is how we all imagine it, I'm sure. He says, we were flying above large cumulus crowd clouds. Minch suddenly waggled his wings and dived down. And on looking, I saw eight German machines in formation be below us. They were led by a blood red plane. Of course, straight away, we're all thinking of them ripped off in there, aren't we? There was no time to think or be frightened as Minch, Caldwell and myself died straight amongst them. All was chaos for a few seconds. We shot one down in our first attack. Caldwell was closely pursued by several Germans and his machine was riddled with bullet holes. I escaped with a few bullet holes after seeming to have an albatross on my tail shooting at me every time I looped around. Can you imagine that being up there being chased by these things shooting at you? Um, and that's the actual airfield, airfield where he's based there near to Savvy. And uh, really, I, I've put that up there because I couldn't think of three lines from a book that sum up the type of person that was flying in the Royal Flying Corps than this. For me, Major Eric Powell would sum up all of these pilots and talk about a life well lived, if even cut short. Major Eric Powell, who was a went on to become um, one of the uh, art teachers and head of houses or housemasters at Eton. Before he'd flown fighter aircraft in the First World War, had won the Diamond Skulls at Henley and also rode in the Olympic Games. And then almost fittingly was killed in a mountaineering accident between the wars. I just, these guys just never cease to amaze me with what they pack into their short lives. And the amount of times I've been on tour and people have said, these poor lads they never got to live the fruitful life and yet you come up time and time again of these guys absolutely incredible olympians mountaineers fighter pilots that's some cv one of the most dangerous roles to be taken on uh, during the somme battle would be that of balloon busting or as they used to say frying a sausage would be one of the ways they would describe it as well jeffrey norris describes the events on 16th of September when a Rolls Royce car drew up at number 60 Squadron Airfield at Vert Geland. Vert Geland is well worth a visit on any battlefield tour if you're interested. Uh, you can work out from where the five crossroads meet, the five spurs of the roads meet, you can work out where all of the various squadrons are located. There were two or three squadrons located just in the one small area there. Well worth a visit if you get a chance. General Trenchard, Trenchard stepped out of the Rolls Royce and after the pirates of pilots had been assembled, 
He told them that three enemy balloons had been hoisted and these had to be shot down because they were overlooking the tank park. The tanks had only just been brought into the battle. And of course they'd been used the first day, time the day earlier. Three pilots were chosen from those who stepped forward. Remember, Trenchard said to them, it is far more important to get those balloons than to fail and come back. It's not the sort of order I'd like off my commander really, but uh, it's fairly to the point. And you can see the best way to take out um, uh, balloons at this stage was not incendiary bullets as such, but the use of these rockets that you can see, they almost look like something that Brox would make for fireworks, but nevertheless, there they are. Um, that is the typhoon of its day there. Uh, here we see one in action. This is a, a smaller single-seated monoplane firing these Lepreur rockets at a German uh, captive kite balloon. Uh, and we have an account of it here. Lieutenant Roderick Hill approached at a height of 7,000 feet and put, he put his new port fighter into an almost vertical dive. He held his fire under intense ground fire until within 400 yards before he fired. The balloon blew up in flames and almost in his face. He then had to fire through those flames, emerge out the other side where everyone on the ground was trying to shoot at him. Uh, and he couldn't see for the next uh, 30 seconds or so, hoping he was in the right spot before he rose up and managed to escape. Now, if that doesn't put you off joining the Royal Flying Corps, for some people, this war above the, uh, the air actually encouraged them amazingly. And that's why we turn to this chap here, Air Commodore um, Freddie West. Uh, West was actually um, had had his father had been killed in the Boer War when he was only six, so didn't really get to know his dad. He was raised in Italy and Switzerland by his French mother. And he describes, he was actually serving in the Royal Manchester Fusiliers at the time, and he describes that air fighting had become a real reality in 1916. Air reconnaissance by daylight and the consequent aerial dogfights above the trenches broke the monotony of life. And this is an incredible piece of writing, I think, if this is how he genuinely felt. These men went to war like gladiators. It was a fight to the death when they met and had the audience of the opposing armies watching them and cheering them from the ground. It was a fantastic version of a Roman arena, but there was no avoiding the comparison. The kill was spectacular as the defeated plane crippled or burning with a plume of black smoke pouring from it in a long comet's tail descended faster and faster to meet the ground with a thud somewhere over the hills. The victorious side in the trenches would cheer till their throats hurt. The vanquished side, a couple of hundred yards away, would stand silent. I mean, that's enough to put me off getting in an aircraft ever again, let alone enlisted, but he did enlist. Um, he joined the uh, army as a private in the Army Medical Corps, and then, as I mentioned, he was commissioned into the Royal Munster Fusiliers. Shortly after the Somme, he transferred over to the Royal Flying Corps, inspired by these sort of things that he saw. He was actually awarded a Victoria Cross um, in August of 1918, when on a bombing raid. Um, he commanded a wing of aircraft in France in 1940. He then went on to become uh, the air attaché, not only in Rome, but then later in neutral Switzerland. And from that position, he assisted downed pilots making their way to safety. In fact, the Gestapo had a purse out on his head. And uh, just to top it all off there, he ended life as a, the chairman of J. Arthur Rank Films. So next time you see someone whacking that big gong before the black and white movie starts, just think about Air Commodore Freddie West and his experiences. Now, it's fair to say that constant offensive patrolling would take its toll on both sides during the summer of 1916, as that very uh, you know, visual image there shows. Firstly, from a German perspective, Oswald Bolker and Max Immelmann were both killed, two of the most uh, highly respected adversaries and pilots from the German side, adversaries to the, to the Allied side, obviously. And the German uh, air historian between the wars, Johann Werner, writes, that the July and August of 1916 are the blackest days in German air aviation. But the Royal Flying Corps too also suffered two of its most popular and famous characters, Leno Hawker <coughs> and uh, of course Bron Lucas were also killed. Bron Lucas in 19, uh, in the November of 1916, buried in uh, Ecuse, Maine, there at HAC Cemetery. Sholto Douglas uh, announces what it was like coping with these losses in his own memoirs where he says, 
one of the harshest lessons that we all had to learn was to push personal feelings and emotions caused by casualties into the back of our minds and even if possible to forget them and that was very personal to him because he lost his brother during this period of the war of course we had our own balloonatics these were highly important for observation work uh, not easy to attack at all because balloon sites are often defended by anti-aircraft guns uh, they have grouped machine guns around their bases for low level defense and also often we had our own patrolling aircraft flying around to protect them the reason they were so important is their ability to correct falling shot for artillery actually correct it in live time a lot more reliable than the aircraft flying over the top gives you an oblique view you can also spend longer in a balloon than you can in the air i think the record to being exposed is one chap spent 14 hours in one of those baskets observing what was going across the wire and that enabled you to build up the habits of the enemy their patrol activity when their reliefs took place any sort of uh, works that they're doing you'd be able progressively you see them being undertaken and help shell them uh, when i looked into it i found eight balloon observer casualties during the battle they're quite hard to shoot down i think peter hart when he gives his talk on the raw flying corps gives a great example of how if you're trying to shoot an aircraft down you literally get behind it and fly at the same speed and the same height and far into the rear but with a balloon because it's static it's a kite balloon it's held to ground like a kite you keep flying by it you have to come back and so you only get to shoot it every so often it's a very very good lesson there but nevertheless eight observer casualties during the battle they did carry parachutes the most famous one of all being there you can see basil hallam radford uh, better known to many as Gilbert the Filbert, the nut with a K, the pride of Piccadilly, the blase roué. Very handsome man by all accounts and very popular. Uh, by this stage he's serving in the Balloon Corps and uh, on the time of his death, initially they say there was a fault in the aircraft and it got, or in, in the balloon, he got snagged in the wires. The reality is that actually there was a third person in that balloon, only two parachutes. It uh, um, gets cut away from its moorings, starts drifting towards the enemy wire. Uh, the two that are with him use the parachutes, and meaning that uh, Radford hasn't got one. And he's seen drifting over towards the enemy lines around about 6,000 feet, his feet over the balloon, deciding whether to jump or not before he eventually does. And of course, you can imagine it's the end of poor um, Radford and Gilbert. Uh, he's now buried in Cooing Military Cemetery. Not something that I would like to do, being one of those balloons, I have to say. One of my personal favourites, and they really do take their part in the battle towards the tail end, however, are these guys here, Naval 8. And this is the airfield I mentioned that you can go and visit now on the crossroads. You can see these hangars they took over. Naval 8 were Royal Naval Air Service pilots that were largely employed up on the coast around Dixmuda, uh, Dunkirk, that sort of area. Uh, sort of liaising between the coast and the shore. Um, but in October 1916, the Admiralty decided that on urgent representation of the Army Council, that they would dispatch at once a squadron of 18 fighting aeroplanes from the Dunkirk Command for temporary duty with the British Expeditionary Force. And so these guys attach themselves to the Royal Flying Corps and serve in the tail end of the Somme. They're also down in the Arras fighting, by which stage time uh, they've moved to um, uh, Mont Saint Quentin and here we see uh, an extract from their diary which said uh, a fine bright day and a lot of flying done Goebel shot down a German machine in the morning in the region of Gomacor there he is in the right and in the afternoon many patrols were carried out Galbraith brought down a German machine near Miramont very cold weather and several uh, pilots suffering from frostbite in the face. Imagine that, so cold that when you take off in your aircraft, you actually get frostbite on your face. Must be quite horrific. Um, we've already mentioned uh, one of the chaps, the Mad Major there, uh, flying underneath the bridges. He was part of Naval 8. If you get a chance to read that, it's a fantastic account of their action throughout the war but also they've done a really good squadron history which is simply called naval eight and i'd say if you want to learn more about uh, air fighting that's a really good book to to start with so what did douglas haig make of the bills we start to head towards our uh, conclusion then 
Well, he did have regular meetings with Trenchard. And when we look at his diaries, we just take a few examples of that. 31st of July, 1916, General Trenchard reported regarding the Flying Corps. More German machines were seen yesterday than any time during this battle, but not more than 20 crossed our line and none got very far. The previous day, eight crossed our line. On the other hand, we made 451 separate flights over the enemy front two days ago and over 500 yesterday. Germans have concentrated nearly all of their aeroplanes on the Somme front, very few now remaining at Verdun. The following month, General Trenchard reported on the work of the Flying Corps. Owing to clouds, enemy aircraft have an easier time, so it's showing more activity. But the first fine day, Trenchard is confident they will be knocked out again. Today, numbers of hostile aeroplanes were engaged with most satisfactory results. Fighting was continuous till dark. We suffered no casualties, though enemy in several cases were pursued back to their aerodromes. And you can see we start to meet more regularly as the battle progresses. On the 4th of September, General Trenchard reported on the Flying Corps, he's quite satisfied that we can hold our position of superiority in the air until next spring. He gets that just about right because the Germans are completely dominant by the April, of course. But he's anxious lest the Germans bring out by then some new type of swift machine thanks to their better engines. He has long urged for our authorities at home to concentrate their efforts on our best type of engine, the Rolls-Royce. Apparently only 300 of these are on order, whilst there are 3,000 of the inferior factory experimental type also being produced, which will be of little use to us. Now, as someone who's a student of Haig continually, I don't think we can ever learn enough about the man. I think that's interesting there that he shows almost uh, he is deferring to someone's greater knowledge of subordinate rank when it comes to these things. So he wouldn't just talk over the top of someone. If someone knew more about the subject than him, he would listen and he would take it on board. There was just the one Victoria Cross awarded during the Battle of the Somme itself, and it is to this chap here, Lionel Brabazon Rees, often known as Brabazon Rees, flew with 32 Squadron, and uh, was certainly with them on the 1st of July 1916. Wasn't credited with eight kills on the 1st of July, I have to say. That was uh, throughout his whole time uh, in the air. Uh, he'd enlisted in the Royal Garrison Artillery initially. He was a marksman there uh, with, um, with revolver and with rifle, despite being an artilleryman. And one of his favourite tricks would be to get someone at uh, a, a distance of 25 yards to hold up a business card and he would shoot through the center of the business card with both his right and his left hand. Volunteers, please. Uh, after he came back from West Africa with the, uh, his unit, he decided he wanted to learn to fly. So he went to the Bristol Flying School in January 1913. He didn't do this as part of the course, did it all at his own cost. And eventually he crossed over to France with 11 squadron uh, in the early start of the war. Uh, he was awarded a military cross in September 15 at the Battle of Luz for air fighting. So we're starting to see the first examples of air-to-air -air combat there. Uh, learning from this, he wrote a lot of the War Office doctrine papers, including one that was called Fighting in the Air. Uh, he did this, went back and lectured on it, uh, raised awareness of it to try and get our pilots to learn more about how it would be to fight in the air before he returned to France in May 1916 just in time for the Somme battle, where he was flying a DH-2, as you can see in the top left. And on the 1st of July, 1916, Major Rees, whilst on flying duties, sight what he thought was a bombing party of our machines returning home, but were in fact enemy aircraft. Major Rees was attacked by one of them, but after a short encounter, it disappeared damaged. The two others then attacked him at long range, but he dispersed them, seriously damaging two of the machines. He chased two others and was wounded in the thigh, temporarily losing control of his aircraft. He righted it and then he closed with the enemy, using up all of his ammunition, firing at very close range. He then returned home and landed his aircraft safely. And he was very badly wounded. They actually had to help him out of the aircraft and carry him off to the dressing station. For that, he was awarded a Victoria Cross, became a very well-known pilot, actually came back to flying school there. When the Sopwith Camel came out, it got a very unfavorable reputation with young trainee pilots who felt it was dangerous. So he took it up for a spin himself and performed 
um, it describes area acrobatics hitherto unseen in this new Sopwith Camel. Uh, he then, after the war, became the assistant commandant at Cranwell when it first started up. Uh, the Air Ministry recall him in 1940, by which time he's living in Nassau in the Bahamas, decides to sail back himself. It's almost commonplace. These, these blokes were all like each other, weren't they? Incredible characters. Uh, and his legacy lived on in the Royal Air Force for quite some time, certainly up till the 1950s. Um, anyone that was obsessed with flying in the RAF would be referred to as a Reese after him. And I think that's a lovely thing, a lovely sort of legacy to have. Almost something that we should reintroduce. Hopefully someone is a serving Royal Air Force pilot on the audience and they'll tell me they still use that phrase today. So as we hit at the hour mark, we just come into a close then. And we should say that the total raw flying core strength for the Battle of the Somme that we employed 421 aircraft and 14 balloons. However, casualties damaged, not shot down, so aircraft are damaged more than once, which is why you have that figure, 800 aircraft report damage and 252 pilots became casualties, either killed, wounded, missing or prisoner during the battle. And you can see there, I can't see it because I've got the uh, screen sharing thing over the top of it, um, but by um, the work of the Royal Flying Corps, by taking the offensive and carrying the war in the air beyond the enemy line, our artillery aeroplanes are free to carry on their important duties of observation and phot photography unmolested. Our communications too, on which so much depends, are undisturbed. And that was Haig's entry, Haig's own recognition of the good work of the Flying Corps in enabling the rest of the ground forces to go about their job. And it's not only Haig that has words on it as well, because if we look at the German line there, you can see that uh, von Bullow says, um, with the aid of aeroplane observation, the hostile artillery neutralized our guns and was able to range with most extreme accuracy on the trenches occupied by our infantry. The enemy aircraft inspired our troops with a feeling of defenselessness. So you have both sides of the wire commanders there talking about the role and the achievements of the air services during the Battle of the Somme. We should look at those sacrifices though, and even though the photograph there is from 1917, it would have been commonplace amongst the cemeteries to find these uh, crosses made out of propellers that mark our flyers. And this is a short extract from Sagittarius Rising, which I think sums up the losses. And it's when Cecil Lewis returns to his squadron after a brief time at home. Where's Rudd, I asked. Only four chaps here, where are the others? Killed, Archie anti-aircraft fire this morning. I couldn't believe it somehow. Suppose so. Machine took fire. Couldn't even recover the bodies. The boy who spoke was only 18 too. A good pilot, brave. Rudd had been his roommate. God, how quiet the mess was. And Hoppy? Wounded, gone home. And Pip and Kid? I was almost frightened to ask. Done in last night. Direct hit. One of our own shells. The battery rung up to apologise. New pilots are coming. Quite a chilling little extract there, isn't it? So I'll end with that. This is from Hilary St. George Saunders, who wrote in his History of the Royal Flying Corps per Adua that by the end of the Battle of the Somme, the old days of taking snapshots at the enemy were over and done. Now the Vickers and the Lewis gun were as indispensable as any part of the aeroplane as its engine. And with that, I'll say over to you, David. Clive, thanks ever so much indeed. That was tremendous. Th thoroughly enjoyed that, uh, as I'm sure that everybody else did who's watching. As a, uh, if you know, you know the tradition now, Clive. So if, if you enjoyed that, please do raise your hands using the button uh, below on the Zoom, just to, uh, just to, as a sign of appreciation. And Clive, I can confirm there's hundreds of hands going up. <laughs> we, we, we've had. Uh, well over 450 people watching on Zoom and we've had well over 120 people watching on, on Facebook. So we've had a, a brilliant audience tonight. So it's mm -hmm. question and answer time now, everybody. So um, whilst everybody's tapping in the questions into, into the Zoom software, I'll just deal with the first one that came in well before you actually um, even appeared on Zoom, uh, Clive, which is from Terry. 
Terry Jackson, who says, uh, who asks, how long after the Germans did we introduce interrupted gear onto our own fighters? So I'll let you answer that one whilst everybody else is typing in their own questions. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure that there'll be a techie out there who'll give me the exact date, but I think actually we, we the French do it before us as well. We're a little bit late to the party with that, aren't we? Uh, so the um, the French have a system of doing it. Is it Roland Garros is one of the original guys as well using a similar sort of, uh, um, because it's Dutch invention, isn't it? That interrupter gear, have I got that right? I'm sure it's oh, the Dutch uh, invention. Uh, Fokker, um, in, invented it and he was actually... Yeah, um, um, but it's certainly months, it's certainly months, it's not weeks. Most of these things take uh, months to go through. So um, yeah, it's certainly months. And then you see... As I try to make the point there, just one little invention or innovation gives the other side superiority. And when you're on the offensive, air superiority is absolutely critical. So that's how we end up with the situation we had uh, at the Battle of Arras, where we literally had to put more aircraft into the sky to maintain the superiority, knowing that some of them will be shot down. Sure, yeah. Okay, th thanks for that. Um, if anybody's got any... Uh, Anything to, to suggest as, as any of the more technical answers to any of these, just please do tap in on Q&A and, and I'll try and pick up these points as we go through it. Um, okay, so um, Julia Williams um, says um, that, uh, Clive, thanks for a great talk. I don't have a camera, unfortunately. Mm. But would you like to ask, but would I like to ask you what, what pilots felt towards the troops in the trenches? Did they feel more or less vulnerable than them? That's from Julia. Uh, that's a really interesting question, actually, because um, it was one of the, uh, as you know, when I write these talks, I usually write them, they last about two hours, and then I cut loads of stuff out, David, because I know you've got to keep to your timings. Uh, and one of the things I was going to talk about was there are a number of occasions when pilots, for whatever reason, decide they want to go up and see what life was like in the line. Now, of course, you have a number of pilots that have actually come from the trenches, so they would have personal experience themselves. I think all pilots generally have a respect, air crews have a respect for the troops fighting on the ground and the conditions. Um, but uh, when they get the opportunity, they go up to the front line, look for themselves. And I think it's, um, it's uh, William Fry in Ace of Battle manages to get a lift up and he's actually sat on this wonderful mound, he says, that he says he can look over the front line. And sure enough, before long, someone says, you can't stay there, mate. That's Posier's windmill. That'll be shelled in about two minutes. <laughs> and of course it is, and it is shelled. But the way he talks about the shelling is quite incredulous. He says, you know, I laughed hysterically because I thought this was amazing. These shells were aiming for me and nothing I experienced. You almost think one of the, the hidden things that we perhaps didn't get a chance to talk about here for these pilots was the psychological impact the war has on them. Because unlike your infantrymen, and I say this as a, you know, as a sort of a signaler, um, you know, you go into when you're on exercise you get so wet you get so cold you know roughly when it's going to end and you get used to it but these guys fighting for an hour and a half then they get back and within 20 minutes pianos nurses champagne hot baths you know it would have been quite incredible to go from the horror of one thing to that another and then have to go back into that horror so i think the psychological drain on pilots is probably worse than 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 those on the ground I can imagine it being psychologically damaging. That mm -hmm. night. Absolutely. Graham, Graham Nolan, do you just want to mute yourself there, Graham? Mm -hmm. uh, thanks for your uh, talk. Fascinating. The uh, question is, why was Trenchard uh, selected for command of the RFC? What particular qualities did he have? Um, I, I think he was kind of bullish enough you can see that in this this insistence on offensive patrolling was probably the answers that they were looking for um and i also think it was more that henderson was brought back to the uk to to do the wider work with the war office that made the opportunity um available i'm not so sure graham who the other candidates are is it a subject you know about or is it just you're generally interested you know i can only say that i think he had that kind of uh, you know this is my views and this is how I'm going to do it attitude that uh, probably appealed when did he got the job in August 15, didn't he? So it'd still be John French at that time. Um, it would have appealed to him, you know, someone who says, this is what I'm going to do for you. It's quite a big step up from what he had. I mean, it looks like he's promoted three or four rungs up the ladder in one go. 
Um, and we should do, if we just briefly mention on Trenchard, there is quite a good sort of um, research or story to be looked at later on in the war where uh, he's sort of courted by the press to try and speak out against Hague um, and uh, out of loyalty refuses to do it. And then the press say, well, in that case, what we're going to do is we're going to publish a story anyway, effectively, and say that you refuse to take part and a uh, bit of a deal's done. But his loyalty to Hague re remains throughout, right through to the end of the war. Uh, and there's certainly a bit of interference with him back home to try and say, look, you've got to speak out about this guy, we're going to get Hague removed. The trench yard was having none of it. And of course, he ended up forming them or, or being uh, commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, um, which is when he, he bought uh, part of the old Graham White aircraft factory at Hendon and turned it into what we now know as the, the Met Police Training College at Hendon. So that was another of his roles. Interesting character. Yeah. Three of, I think three of his four sons were killed in, in the war. All right. Pretty certain, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank th you. Th thanks, thanks for your question there, Graham. Um, Right, so Bill, um, Bill Twist, you want to un unmute yourself there? Uh, Clive, thank you very much for that. That was Sorry. terrific. Uh, and, um, you know, your, your enthusiasm shows through. And I'm glad you referenced Captain W.E. Johns and Bigglesworth. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. I totally agree with you there, Bill. Absolutely. I'm glad that we got that one in. <laughs> and of course, you know, the, 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 um, the legacy of that time shows through in current Royal Air Force squadron numbers. You know, you've got one F squadron, fighter squadron. Interestingly, not uh, according to Trenchard, it, that I suppose should be reconnaissance one you know, rather mm. than 4R squadron. Yeah. Anyway, my question is, um, in the 1916 era, have you seen any evidence of a growing tendency towards, uh, you know, UDI, towards becoming an independent organisation, as happened on the 1st of April 1918? Structurally, I think as long as it's work, you can see it as long as it was working within the, uh, still attached to the armies, you would still need to, they would, they were starting to become larger than a core. Um, and... I think this is a natural thing that happens when any formation gets above a certain size. Um, you know, and so they get to, it becomes unwieldy to be just a raw flying corps. And I think also that, you know, we see that I mentioned Naval 8 Squadron attached to them that go on, David Tatsu taught me this on a battlefield years ago, go on to become 208 Squadron or whatever. But, you know, they, you know, that we see the, we see the potentials of air power and where it's going. And uh, it's, um, it does take a long while to get to the 1st of April, 1918, and the, uh, the formation of a Royal Air Force independently. But I think the Somme is the first large, large, large battle where they play a significant role, where at the end of it, they could almost uh, start their empire building, if that's without being derogatory. You know, they, they've got, they can start to build their case. I think, start to build their case. I, I, thank you. I, I'm, you know, I'm glad that they were there. Uh, you know, when we get through to the hundred days and the last push in in 1918, that they were yeah. an independent and large scale force. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. I, I, the only thing I would add as well is the culture of of, of UDI is starting to appear in that um, uh, far more of the pilots from this period of the war uh, refer to themselves as being Royal Flying Corps. And as late as 1915, you would often see their battalion regimental cap badge being worn, and they would also refer to their regiment over their, their current role, if that makes sense. So I think there's another indicator there on the ground. Thanks, thanks, Bill. Cheers. We've um, got a couple of points uh, coming back um, at us from... Uh, um, a couple of attendees about the interrupted year uh, question. Mm. Uh, so first of all, we've got one from Jonathan Dale. Jonathan, hello, Jonathan, um, has uh, said uh, the French bolted the deflector plate to the propeller. Okay. Uh, this sparked the Germans to commission Fokker to develop a better system. Um, so thanks for that, Jonathan. But yeah. we've also got Alan Wakefield. Hello, Alan, uh, from the oh, War Museum. Um, Alan's telling us the first aircraft in the Royal Flying Car to have uh, interrupted gear fitted was the Sopwith one and a half Strutter, which came mm. into service in France in late May 16. So thanks for that, Alan. Mm. Uh, appreciate uh, appreciate you. 
Yeah, we're helping us out with a few of the... Uh, yeah, facts, hope, facts, hope it's not too long before Alan and I are in Salonica again as well. I'm sure uh, the Royal Flying Corps have a role to play out there. I'm, I, I, I'm looking forward to getting out to uh, to at least France um, or, or elsewhere before too long. Right, let's have a look at... Um, next question, Mark. Um, do you want to unmute yourself, Mark? Um, yes, th thanks, David, and, and thank you, Clive. Very interesting. Right. In, uh, in 1996, I was commanding the uh, Army Air Corps workshop out in Northern Ireland. Right. And uh, it being the 80th anniversary of the Somme at the time, we flew a uh, Britain Norman Islander uh, across to the Somme to sort of reunite the, uh, the Army Air Corps with its forebearers. Uh, whilst there, came across the grave of Philip Ryland Pinsent. Uh, from mm. 34 Squadron, who died on the 24th of uh, September. Having then um, looked through his flying history, he spent a lot of time doing test flights, which then brings back to my role as an aircraft engineer. How reliable were the aircraft? And in terms of battlefield repair and getting aircraft back up into the air, uh, how well did the, the engineers on the ground, the people that you don't hear very much about, mm. how did they get on? Yeah, you're right, actually, and I feel guilty for not actually talking about them, uh, you know, a, a little bit more about how, how they um, they had to get the things right and back at operational as quickly as possible. Um, reliability of the aircraft, it's interesting, 60% of the aircraft that we lose between the period of July and November are not to enemy air action, they're actually to faults on the aircraft. Uh, mm -hmm. So that was just not as reliable as we'd like them to be. Um, and I mentioned, um, i trying to think, I think it was, it wasn't Mr. Fry, it was the other book I mentioned, uh, which is called Wings Over the Somme. Uh, I think it's Gordon, someone. But uh, he, in there, he, he transfers to a squadron and they've got five different types of aircraft on the flight. And so only one service ball of the aircraft he's about to take off. And they say to him, Go and take that for a test flight, get used to it, but don't crash it, it's the only one we got. He takes it out and crashes it, uh, lands it in a field which he thinks is, doesn't realise is the end of the airfield, it's actually a ploughed field. And so they post him away for another five weeks whilst they repair it before he, before he comes back. So I think the problem with even in 1916 is until we've got consistency uh, and you have the engineers all trained on how to repair and service SE5As on a squadron entirely of SE5As, it's going to be a bit hit or miss. Does that make sense? Because if you're flying six different types of aircraft in a flight and you know what it's like for annual leave, courses, all that sort of stuff, a marine parasol goes down and we say, we need that fixing. Oh, he's, he's on leave at the moment. I only know how to do FE2. So, Yeah, you, you train people to type of aircraft so they absolutely. then understand those aircraft rather than... Yeah. Uh, people trying to cover multiple aircraft at the same time mm, yeah so i mean i think it's not as good as it becomes later on in the war thank you very much it's the whole whole of the first world war is about progression isn't it and learning Absolutely. really and getting better and improving great right thanks for that i'm just checking uh, questions which are coming in um john john azar do you want to uh, mute yourself john welcome from uh, from the west coast of canada there yeah, not uh, not quite as hot as you're having it right now. <laughs> um, that uh, last question led into mind. So with all this innovation going on, um, where was the focal point for development? You've got the designers of aircraft. Now you've got the pilots who are flying them. You've got the mechanics and engineers mm. who are trying to fix them. What was the feedback loop like through all this? It was still of, largely happening back in the UK at places like Farnborough, where a lot of the developments and the innovations are taking place. So there's obviously a bit of a lag. I think like most military operations, and if you're a military person, you, you'll understand it, that you, um, you, know, you do all your training and then you get out in theatre and the first thing you're told is to forget everything you've just been told because it's all different now, you're out here and you have to relearn it again. So we would send back the ideas back to the UK at Farnborough, they'd come up with the innovations. By the time they reached out France again, the problem had changed. And I think that's the largest thing about the air war is that it is continually changing more so than the ground war. Because we are literally only 12 years or so after the Wright brothers, the slightest, slightest little change can give you a significant advantage over your enemy. Um, so that lag of go, putting stuff through the experimentary places back at Farnborough would always take time to catch up again. 
And one of the most telling things there I felt for Hugh Trenchard is when he's saying to Haig, we can probably maintain superiority until the spring. He can't convince, he's not convinced after that because he's aware that we're starting to see the Germans are doing things slightly differently and eventually they'll overtake us. And that represents the lag in us getting that technology to, you know, improve on their improvements, if that makes sense. Great, thank you. No, thank um, you. Thanks, John. Thanks. Ed, you want to just unmute yourself there? Well, thank you very much for that, uh, for that talk. It was absolutely fantastic. Um, I've heard the story of Cecil Lewis so many times over the years. And some of the stories you hear that he was close to Lac Nagar when the mine, mine exploded and it shook his aircraft and all that. And I'm just wondering why, if that's factual, uh, mm -hmm. why they would be so close to areas where the, where the mines were going to be detonated and, and the potential problems that it would cost to the, to the aviators and the aircraft themselves. Now, I'm hoping I got this story right, but I've heard so many versions of it. I really don't know the actual facts of it. So I'm hoping you can provide some clarity for that. Yeah, you, it is right. It is true. He is flying over that area and he's doing contact patrols with the 34th Division who are going to be attacking him through La Cell. And um, uh, I'm, as an ex-signaler, I'm not proud to say it, but often a lot of the, the breakdowns uh, in the First World War about the communications and uh, the fact that he's flying over the top of it and goes off is because no one's told them. Uh, so it's as simple as that. The, the, the word has not been really spread to say, you know, expect these mines to be going off at this certain, this set time. Uh, so, you know, we tell most people most things and another thing people don't tell enough to. And uh, in this case, I think he's quite lucky. Now, I'm always amazed because, of course, on the 1st of July, three mines go off in that little area. So, yeah. you know, if you weren't buffeted by one, you'd be buffeted by the other. Um, but he doesn't return straight home. He carries on, carries on for a bit and gets on with his job before he goes back. So, yeah, you got the story right. Oh, great. And like you said, the, the, the stats you provided uh, with regards to the rest of his life are just astounding. I mean, this well man done. had a remarkable life. <laughs> and the fact that he won an Oscar, my God, that I did not know. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. That's, that's stunning. It, it, it really is. It just goes to show that these guys just weren't soldiers. They just weren't uh, pilots. They just weren't seamen. They actually, they actually counted for a whole lot Incredible. after the war. And yeah. uh, that's, a, that's a fantastic perspective to maintain as far as I'm concerned. Absolutely. No, thank you. Thank, thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Ed, Ed where, where are you joining us from there? I'm joining you from my deck uh, in Newfoundland. Uh, it's 32 degrees here right now, and uh, it'd be a shame for me to be inside because it's only a few months away, and there's going to be six feet of snow out of my car. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm taking advantage of the best we can. Now we've been having a fabulous summer here, and uh, I, I know you mentioned in the preamble that the, it was warm in England, uh, uh, but it's uh, it's beautiful here. Yeah, that Wonderful. sounds warm there. We've certainly got thanks for that, Ed. Thanks. We've certainly got an international audience tonight, so so I, I'll just. Make, uh, Check in the, the, the following from the USA. We've got New Hampshire, um, Alaska, Virginia, Minnesota, Texas, and Kentucky. This is all on Facebook, by the way. We've got somebody joining us on Facebook from Greece, uh, several from Belgium, somebody from Saskatchewan, and also South Africa. So a truly mm -hmm. international audience. So um, welcome to everybody who, who's, who's joining us uh, tonight. David, David Muir, do you want to just unmute yourself there and ask your question? Thank you very much, Clive. Fascinating talk. I'd, I'd, uh, I'd just like to go back to uh, Douglas Haig. In the manoeuvres in, was it 1912, mm. he was uh, heavily defeated. He was defeated by uh, Grierson, who, who'd, used, uh, who'd used their air power, who'd used their reconnaissance to... Uh, to determine what what Haig was trying to do, hmm. and and yet, uh, is it not a a, th a thing that Haig picked up the lesson from that, and we, because certainly he seems to have uh, become reasonably close to Trenchard in the later years of the war and made great use of the uh, Royal Flying Corps. Hmm. Would you like to comment on that? 
No, that's absolutely brilliant to take me back to that 90s. I'm really pleased you did that. It, it actually, uh, it not, again, not too far from, it's in Hertfordshire where the exercises took place and there is a little memorial at the side there where there was the, I think it was the first casualties of the Royal Flying Corps and a little air accident there. Um, there's an obelisk at the side of the road during that exercise. Um, I think Haig being, this is one of the areas where reconnaissance would be very important and Haig being a cavalryman understands the importance of reconnaissance. And so anything that can give him an advantage, I think the moment he's aware of, of, of the possibilities of air power and certainly giving you eyes and ears above the battlefield that you don't get on the ground. And I think it's no coincidence that uh, five squadron are attached to him as early as the Battle of the Marne at his request. He asked for that as an asset, whereas the Smith Dorian asked for three squadron a little bit afterwards saying, well, that's a good idea. I'll have one as well. And I think that's the moment then that he realizes the importance of it. He says, now I've got it to play with myself. I can really see what it does. So, yeah, he was a great advocate of, of air power. And I think he uses it to his advantage. And he, he's continually, we didn't mention it, but he's continually asking for more squadrons. And the reason he doesn't get the squadrons is because they're worried about the defense of the airspace over London. Um, but he was certainly someone that wanted more aircraft all the time. And he would, as we mentioned there, he would actually defer to Trenchard's knowledge in the area, say, well, you tell me, what should I be doing? What should I be asking for? But a really good point. Yeah, that's definitely the first time he, he learned from it. Th thanks, David, for your question there. Um, got another couple of questions. There's some folk without the ability to... To, to put the webcam on. So um, I'll ask Edward Fletcher's question here, which was, uh, when were parachutes uh, introduced? Um, that's Ed Fletcher from, from Cheltenham. So I'm not sure when they were actually introduced. My understanding on parachutes is, from my limited knowledge, is that the first thing is you still hear this nonsense. Someone sometimes said that they were, aircraft were so valuable, so they wouldn't give the pilots parachutes. Yeah. This, 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 uh, why is it we try and make up this stuff as if, you know, the Great War wasn't bad enough, we'd go out of our way to try and kill as many of his own men as we could is ridiculous. My understanding is that the, it's just the size of the parachutes. Oh, right. because they're, yeah. they're, you know, on the b baskets of balloons, they're almost like inverted static line, right? And you're attached to them and you go through a wicker basket and it turns it inside out and then you can descend to the earth. And it's, not until they get over that portability um, issue that you're able to put them on aircraft because before that it would just unbalance the whole thing. So if one of our 500 or so people out there knows the exact date that parachutes were first in, I'd, I'd love to know myself really. Thanks, thanks for your, for your answer there Clive. Hope that uh, answered your question there Ed. Um, mm. Alan, Alan Reid again, not on camera. Uh, do, that says this, do, do we underestimate the influence of the Royal Naval Air Service on the later RAF? Rank structure, he says. Cranwell was a, originally a, a naval establishment, but perhaps more importantly, a, na a, a Navy tends to think strategically, while an mm. army thinks tactically, and the mm. Royal Naval Air Service um, <coughs> have the gen perhaps had the genesis of the... Um, uh, strategic bombing that's in summary yeah no that is absolutely right there on the strategic bombing and of course it was because the um the importance of those channel ports and uh and and how our ability to control them meant that we were continually launching raids up the flanders coast and there's a uh, a couple of very good memoirs from that period as well i think naval eight a bit like the royal naval division shine um, quite often on the Western Front, I think Naval Eight equally stand out as being quite an exceptional uh, squadron. Whenever we look at them, uh, they um, they just tend to attract the sort of people that are just incredible individuals, and uh, there is a camaraderie in Naval Eight that is very hard to beat. I mean, that's, if you look at the stuff, if I, when I was giving the talk, I stopped briefly because I got it wrong, didn't it? It was. Um, uh, it wasn't uh, Mont St. Quentin, it was Mont St. Elwar, Elwar right? yeah. which is what I meant, uh, which was on the tip of my tongue. But when they were at Mont St. Elwar, I mean, the Naval 8 guys there, they used they, they erected their own swimming pool, David, you know, out of using uh, balloon canvas. And, uh, you know, they would, they would keep all of their naval traditions that were really important. 
Um, so I think on a cultural level, they have a lot of influences on the way messes are run in the Royal Air Force by the end of the war. But I think you're right on the strategic bombing. I think sometimes they do. They've got a bigger vision picture of where we're going than actually the army has at times and that's just because of the size of the Royal Navy and the ability of the Royal Navy to project its force they would understand where they sit in that as one of those those, those lethal weapons in the Royal Navy being out project its force is the Royal Naval Air Service I'm a big fan yeah definitely Great. Well, look, it's, it's virtually half past nine now, so I think what we'll do is, is call that a day. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I, I've certainly enjoyed that. We've not uh, had enough talks, I don't think we've had any talks about the RAF Royal Flying Corps Royal Naval Air, Air Service before, so we, we've uh, at least corrected that uh, tonight. Um, Clive, that was really enjoyable. If everybody would like to once again raise their hands as a final Round of applause uh, to Clive for, for a, a superb presentation. Clive, I can tell you that there's hundreds of hands going up there um, as, as a silent, um, but nevertheless heartfelt thank you. Um, right, ladies and gentlemen, there isn't a webinar next week because we're only doing them fortnightly now, but the next uh, webinar is in two weeks' time with Julian Whippy. So please do get uh, yourselves registered for that one. Um, Clive, thanks very much indeed. I'll be in no touch later. And ladies and gentlemen, um, good evening. Thanks very much. Good night. Mademoiselle from Armitage, Parliament. Mademoiselle from Armitage, Parliament.